Hello, I'm Bill Salas, and welcome to part two of my message entitled, The Four Reasons to Expect the Decline of America. After part one, I received a very interesting email. I want to read it to you. Bill, my wife, daughter, and I just watched your latest video, America 2021, the Nineveh or Jerusalem principle, which would be part one of this teaching. I thought I detected in your voice a change from all previous videos I have seen from you. Are you getting the feeling that we are much closer to imminent judgment slash destruction on America than anyone would have thought even in the last year? It seems that Satan has a nearly unbreakable spiritual grasp on this nation and on the minds of the sheeple who have no idea what is coming upon them. We are anxiously awaiting part two of your presentation. Blessings, Bud. Well, Bud, yes, I'm extremely concerned about the fate of this nation as, as we enter into 2021, and that's why I'm doing these, this message. Uh, we have waved goodbye to God. We are experiencing his abandonment and wrath. He is not in heaven draped in the American flag and humming the Star Spangled Banner. Now, in part one, I discussed the three, three of the four reasons, the top three, that we can expect the decline of America. Today, we're going to draw our attention to part four, the fourth reason. The USA is only a cowardly young lion in Ezekiel 38, 13. Yes, I do believe America can be found in Bible prophecy. I believe we are actually in the Ezekiel 38 Gog of Magog war prophecy, which many of you are familiar with. So today I'm going to give you the historical, biblical, archaeological, geographical, and geopolitical reasons that I think we'll find the USA in the Ezekiel 38 prophecy. But folks, that's not good news because it would clearly show us having fallen from superpower status. Now, by way of review, number one, the revived Roman Empire is the, the dominant empire of the end times. There's really no reason to believe there's a single superpower nation rivaling it in the last days, namely the USA. But you're also going to find in the Ezekiel 38 prophecy that Russia falls from power and Turkey, that these countries get destroyed. And then the number two is the abandonment wrath. The USA is experiencing the abandonment and wrath of God as specified in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And that is because of number three, American ungodliness has set into this nation. The USA has said goodbye to God. Let's take a brief look at these things, the abandonment, wrath, and the American ungodliness. The abandonment and wrath of God it begins with by the giving over, Romans 1, 24, the lust of the flesh, given over to the lust of the flesh, that's sexual perversion, folks. America is the leading uh, producing country in pornography, an estimated industry of $13 billion annually. Then he is, then as the downward spiral continues, the Lord gives over to vile passions, homosexuality. A recent NBC News study came out in September of 2020 saying that there are over 1 million same-sex household couples living in America today. And then ultimately, the country receives a debased mind. Moral decadence, Romans 1, 28. Here's a map after the George Floyd, uh, in the wake of the George Floyd killing. USA Today came out with this in June. Look at all the protests with the Black Lives Matter concerns, the Antifa, uh, the blue dots represent all the protests that came over this summer during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, rioting and looting were going on in major cities like Portland and Seattle and New York and Philadelphia, et cetera, not to mention Recently, as we enter 2021, they protesters stormed the nation's capital. Why has God abandoned this country? Well, because we have said goodbye, God. This is the, the symptoms of what we have here. I, in the part one, I reviewed the Supreme Court decisions over the last six decades where we waved goodbye to God. 1962, we removed prayer from schools. 1963, a year later, we removed Bible reading from schools. 1973, only a decade after that, we legalized abortion. 1980, we removed the Ten Commandments from schools. Again, these are all Supreme Court decisions. 2003, this is actually a state law was struck down in Texas on a sodomy law, which affected uh, 13 other states with similar laws. 2013, DOMO was struck down, the Defense of Marriage Act. That is the biblical model. One man should be married to one woman. That was the definition of marriage God intended. That was a defin definition of marriage in the Defense of Marriage Act. But the Supreme Court could not defend the constitutionality of the biblical definition of marriage. How far have we fallen? 
This gave way to a redefinition of marriage and same-sex marriage became, marriages became approved in the Supreme Court or Oberfeld versus Hodges in 2015. So now let's turn our attention to the fourth reason. Are we the cowardly young lions of Tarshish in Ezekiel 38? I want to talk to you briefly about the prophecy before I get into the reasons I believe we are in Ezekiel 38. Many of you are familiar with this prophecy. 52 passages in Ezekiel 38 and 39 have some of the most well-described biblical prophecy. It comes in the latter years. I think God wanted us to clearly understand this prophecy for a reason I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this prophecy. A massive invasion by the nations you see in the outer ring map here. Uh, these ancient names, Magog, Meshech, Tagarma, just to name some of them, uh, who Ezekiel wrote about, they are superimposed over their modern day equivalents in this map. They form an outer ring of countries. They're going to come to invade Israel in the last days for plunder and booty. This is a massive, the most massive, dangerous Middle East invasion of all time. And it's forthcoming. And some of us believe it will happen very soon. I want you to notice that none of these countries share common borders with Israel. They're predominantly Muslim, except for Russia. And they've never been Israel's notorious enemies and they're mostly not Arabs. So keep that in mind because we're going to compare that to another prophecy that is Arab. And we'll talk about that briefly as this session goes on. Here's another look at that group of belligerents. This coalition of Ezekiel 38 is defined in Ezekiel 31 through 6. And the general consensus of who they are includes Russia and the southern steppes, like the, some of the breakaway Soviet Union countries, Turkey, Iran, Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, Libya, some people believe Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia would be involved as well. Now, I want to tell you the American forces do not stop this prophecy, this, this invasion, nor do the Israeli Defense Forces. As you will see, America, as we are declining from superpower status, is not in any condition to stop this, this invasion. But what we do find out is God stops it supernaturally. In Ezekiel 38, 19 through 23, we find out there's a great earthquake, and every man's sword will come against one another, their brother. Now remember, this is an invading coalition coming from the uttermost parts of the north of countries that speak different languages. When this great earthquake comes, it will panic them. They will freak out and they'll begin to kill one another. There'll be pestilence and bloodshed as a result. And ultimately, there'll be a flooding rain to mess that all up. Great hailstones will pummel upon these forces and there'll be fire and brimstone. And this will clearly be, in the eyes of the nations, a supernatural victory. In the aftermath, it will be clear that God has accomplished Ezekiel 39.7. This is the prophecy, the marquee event of the end times, where God puts the world on official notice. That he's a covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promise-keeping God of Jesus Christ. And here's what we find out. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. I have highlighted their Israel two times. That's because there has to be a chosen people when this prophecy takes place in the land of Israel. Uh, my people Israel. Hitler could not be successful. And he was not successful. He tried to eliminate the Jewish race. Because they have to be in existence for this prophecy to find fulfillment. For God to make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel. And the nation shall know as a result of that supernatural victory that God is the Holy One in Israel, in their promised land. The chosen people in the promised land are two major aspects of the Abrahamic covenant. There has to be an Israel. And the Ottoman Empire controlled from 1517, 1917, the Middle East. There could have been no Israel, but after World War I, we'll see in a map I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, Israel was able to become a nation again, and it became a nation in 1948. So we have these two conditions, the chosen people and the promised land. My people Israel and the land of Israel in place right now for the film fulfillment of the Ezekiel 38 prophecy. Now some of us believe this prophecy is coming around the corner. The relationships between three of the top participants, Russia, Turkey, and Iran, have never been stronger. They've had hosted several summits together over the last few years, 
primarily because they were all involved in the Syrian revolution. And as it's wound down, they've come together to discuss the normalization of Syria and their particular interests inside of Syria. So we've never seen this alliance of these three countries ever come together at this level in the past. This is a strong reason why some of us believe Ezekiel 38 is coming very quickly around the corner. It's developing. The stage is set. Some of my colleagues even think it could happen now. It could be the very next prophecy to keep your eye on. I don't agree with that. I believe it's a next prophecy, and I've written, written about it as a next prophecy in my book entitled The Next Prophecies. These are the have at least one or more significant preconditions that prohibit their final fulfillment. Although these next prophecies appear to be presently stage setting, their completion is being prevented by some other epic prophetic event or series of events. Now, I believe the next prophecies would include the destruction of Russia. That's what we'll be talking about, Ezekiel 38. That's well detailed. As I just mentioned, it'll also be the upholding of God's holy name when this happens. There'll be a decline of Islam. Yes, Allah is about to lose his Akbar. Remember, most of the Muslim most of the countries in Ezekiel 38 are Muslim. Constructing the Jewish temple, the third temple, the tribulation temple. Uh, that's coming, folks. The horror world religion, the global religion of Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17. There'll be 144,000 Jewish evangelists spread across the world preaching the gospel. There'll be the rise of the Antichrist, the white horseman of the first seal judgment in Revelation chapter 6. He's coming. He will be known to the world. He will be a charismatic world leader, and he will rule over a global order in the tribulation period. And after the rapture, folks, unfortunately, there will be severe Christian martyrdom. Now, before I get into talking about America in Ezekiel 38, I want to give you some important details that must be in place for Ezekiel 38 to find fulfillment. And this, these conditions are very clear, well specified. Um, we're going to go through them and I'm going to show you that I don't believe all of them are in place. And if they're not all in place, the prophecy cannot find fulfillment. There's still some preconditions. Now, I think it's time that we all take a closer look at this prophecy because a lot of the, my colleagues just glance over some of these details and don't recognize that they still are prohibiting the prophecy from finding final fulfillment. So some of these details specified in Ezekiel 38, verse 7 through 12 are, the Jews must be, be, be regathered from the nations in the latter years, brought back from the sword into Israel, which had long been desolate. And folks, we've been witnessing that happen since 1948. These conditions have found fulfillment and are still being fulfilled. And we're going to put a check mark in the boxes for these four conditions. But there are more conditions described that we must see if Israel is in those conditions. They must be a peaceful people. They must be living in a land of Israel, of unwalled villages. They must be dwelling securely without walls, bars, nor gates, having silver and gold and acquired livestock and goods, because that is what Russia's coalition is coming after, the booty and great plunder that will be possessed by Israel at that time. Now, folks, I do not believe these are the conditions that have found fulfillment as of yet. Israel is not dwelling securely without walls, bars, or gates. As a matter of fact, in running in the heartland of Israel is a 403-mile partition wall that se separates Palestinian terrorism from Israel proper. So they are not dwelling without walls internally, nor are they dwelling without walls around their borders. They are the most fenced-in and fortified nation in the world, and there's a reason for that. Here's an, I'm going to show you a couple articles on the walls around Israel. This is in September of 2018. There's a 30-foot tall border wall goes up. The IDF says Hezbollah and the Lebanese army are colluding. That's in the Times of Israel. Here's what the article says in summary. The Israeli military this week publicly unveiled its 11-kilometer, 9-meter tall concrete border. That is 7 miles and about 29 feet high at various points. The concrete barrier is designed to serve two main functions, protect Israeli civilians and soldiers from sniper attacks, and you see the tower up there, the, the, the arrow pointing toward it to watch for that, and to prevent infiltration into Israel by Hezbollah operatives. Now, folks, that's why they used to build walls in the ancient times, to prevent, prevent against infiltration. That is why Hezbollah has been digging tunnels to try to infiltrate Israel going underneath the walls. That's just one wall separating Lebanon from Israel, Lebanon to the north from Israel. 
There's another one entirely different. Israel completes Lebanon border wall around Matula, June 12, two times of Israel, six years prior to the last article we just talked about. They're actually also trying to defend against the Hamas in the Gaza by even digging, a, building a sea barrier out into the Mediterranean Sea. That's how concerned and unsafe they are. There are Palestinian pro protesters that are always trying to breach the fences. Uh, here's an article in the LA Times in April of 2018. Uh, the Palestinian protesters breached Israel Gaza border fence. Now, the casualties were there. Now, there are checkpoints, security checkpoints, and fences throughout and uh, bars and gates throughout Israel presently. And it's also around Jordan. Here's the Times of Israel in January of 2016. This is off to Israel's south and southeast, uh, Jordan. Israel starts building a massive fence on the southern border with Jordan. So as these are just a few examples of Israel not dwelling without walls, bars, nor gates, not dwelling securely. Now, the Hebrew words Ezekiel uses twice, in Ezekiel 38.8 and 38.11, is Yeshav Vatak. And he says the Jews were brought out of the nations and now they all dwell safely, Yeshav Vatak. They will go to, you will go Russia against the land of unwalled villages to peaceful people who dwell safely, Yeshav Vatak, without walls and having neither bars nor gates. So this description, this predict, precondition is clear. It has to be met. The Yeshav Vatak, by definition, is not a politically brokered peace deal. It's, it means when a military defeats their enemies, they can dwell Yeshav Batak, they can dwell securely, they can tear down walls because the threat has now been eliminated militarily. So if Israel is not dwelling securely presently, this is still a precondition. When will they dwell securely? Well, Ezekiel fortunately tells us in chapter 28, verses 24 through 26, and I'm going to read it to you. Thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples, among whom they are scattered, that would be the regathering out of the diaspora. We see this has been taking place. And am hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. And they will dwell safely, Yeshav Batak. They will build houses and plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely, Yeshav Batak. When? When I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them, they shall know that I am the Lord their God. The reason they can't dwell securely, tear down the walls, bars, nor gates, is because there are people around them who despise them. They have will need ex judgments executed upon them because they have harbored an ancient hatred against Israel from time immemorial. They are surrounding Israel that share common borders with Israel. I believe they are in their own war prophecy in Psalm 83, written 3,000 years ago by the prophet Asaph. The modern-day equivalents of who Asaph was speaking about, you see in this inner circle, involves Lebanon, where Hezbollah now is operating within. Having over 150,000 missiles, some of them precision-guided. Some of you may recall that Hezbollah and Israel engaged in a war in the summer of 2006, a 34-day conflict, at which time Hezbollah lobbed over 4,000 missiles. Now they've got approximately 150,000 missiles, much more powerful, We've got a bank of targets of Israel that they're pointed at, and they can hit some of these with pinpoint accuracy. The threat is grave for Israel. Syria, Israel and Syria are still at war with each other. It also includes around them Iraq, Jordan, Palestinians, Saudi Arabia, Hamas, and Egypt. I believe these are countries spoken about by Asaph 3,000 years ago in this unfulfilled prophecy. They form an inner circle of countries around Israel, who despise Israel, they are Arabs, they are Muslims, they have harbored an ancient hatred against Israel. They will have to have judgments exercised upon them. And I believe that's coming in the Psalm 83 war. Now remember, that's the inner circle of countries that is not the outer ring of nations in Ezekiel 38. These countries have never been Israel's enemies. They do not share common borders with Israel. They're not around them. And they don't necessarily all despise them presently. In fact, some of them have recently, uh, Morocco, Sudan, uh, who we believe could be in Ezekiel 38, have recently, through the Abraham Accord with Donald Trump, have normalized or developing normalized relationships with Israel. But that will change. These countries will come against Israel in the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. Some people think Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 are the same prophecy, but they are not. We have... 
uh, differences, stark differences. Uh, Psalm 83 involves Arabs versus Jews versus Ezekiel 38, as you saw, predominantly non-Arab nations. There's also other differences, the inner circle of countries around them that despise them, the judgments will need to be executed upon them, the inner circle of Eze Psalm 83 compared to the outer ring of Ezekiel 38. You saw the maps. The goal and the motives are different. As you know, Ezekiel 38 is coming for the plunder and the booty of Israel that Israel possessed at that time. But the other motive in Psalm 83 is different. They want to take the land for possession. Uh, that is a different motive. And then we have the di different defeats. The Lord supernaturally stops Ezekiel 38, what we talked about with the earthquake and the brimstone and the hailstone. Whereas Eze Psalm 83, the Israeli defense forces will be instrumental in being victorious over their Arab enemies. God will use them to execute the judgments upon those around them who despise them. I point this out in my Now Prophecies book and in my Psalm 83 book. I'll show you an image of that in just a moment. Uh, yes, the Israeli Defense Forces exist in fulfillment of Bible prophecy today. And in the end analysis, the different results. God will make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel as a result of Ezekiel 38. And the ancient hatred will be over at the end of Psalm 83. As I said, I've written about this. I'm not going to talk a lot about this particular prophecy because this is about the cowardly young lions in Ezekiel 38. But Psalm 83, I've written a book, The Missing Prophecy Revealed, and got a DVD. It's available at Amazon.com, these products, or at my website, Prophecy Depot. That's Prophecy Depot, like Home Depot.com. Now, some people have uh, disagreed with my teaching on Psalm 83. So I've done a video called Ask the Expert. You can see on the bottom, you can watch this video uh, by going into YouTube and typing in why Psalm 83 is an unfulfilled and standalone prophecy. It's a nine minute video that I address the objections to my teachings on Psalm 83 as still being an unfulfilled prophecy and a war prophecy. Uh, we will also have the link to this in the text box of this YouTube video below. In the video, I answer the questions is Psalm 83 a prophecy or prayer? Well, I believe it's both. You'll see that in the video. Are Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 the same war? No, as the previous slide you showed out, there are stark differences. Was Psalm 83 fulfilled in history? I would say no. Was Psalm 83 fulfilled in the Arab-Israeli wars of 1948 or 1967? I would say no. I think there was a partial fulfillment in 1948 because the countries involved, as you saw in that inner circle of map, inner ring, um, they have, they did come against Israel, but all of Psalm 83 has not been fulfilled as of yet. And I point out in the video why we can count on that. Now let's get into the heart of this message. Where is America in Bible prophecy? Are we a cowardly young lion? Who are the participants in the war of Ezekiel 38? Well, we talked that God is the victor supernaturally. Of course, Israel is the intended victim. Fortunately, they will not be destroyed. God will prevent that. He will make his holy name known in the midst of them in the land of Israel. Then there's the invaders. There's nine of them in total. We saw the outer ring map, Russia, Turkey, and Iran, and a coalition of nine. But there are also at least four other participants. But they're not invading Israel, and they're not protecting Israel. They're protesters, in my estimation. There's Sheba, Didan, the merchants of Tarshish, and their young lions. We find out about them in Ezekiel 38, verse 13. It says Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Speaking to Russia and its coalition, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to take away, carry away gold, to take away great plunder? This is how we know one of the motives of the Ezekiel invasion is for plunder and booty. And But who are these people? Well, Sheba and Dedan. Well, Sheba, we would believe, would be Yemen. Dedan, we would believe, would be Saudi Arabia. Some people think they could also involve the Gulf Cooperation Council, Cooperative Council, which would be the states that share come, uh, border of the Persian Gulf. So Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and the UAE. It could include them as well, but at the very least it includes Saudi Arabia. They are among the protesters. But who are the young lions of Tarshish? This is where it gets interesting. Now, <clears throat> There are two theories of who the young, the lion, who the merchants of Tarshish are, and who their young lions are. Some believe Tarshish 
was Spain, and that their colonies, that they did, the Latino countries of South America, Latin America, Mexico, the offshoots of Spain would be the young lions. Now they base this on, they think that, that uh, Tarsus was Tartessus, which was a harbor city. Uh, the arguments are weak on this. Matter of fact, if you study Tartessus, you find out that it some, it's, seems almost mythical. Some people don't know if it was a city, a mountain, or a river. Uh, I've looked at the arguments closely. I don't think this is the case. For various reasons, I'll show you, <coughs> I'll refute this in this talk. <clears throat> so, therefore, the other theory is Tarsus is the UK, and the Young Lions would be those countries, those offshoot countries, which would include Australia, but namely North America, specifically in this case, I believe we've got America involved. But regardless, we're talking about the merchants of Tarshish. This is a consumer issue here. I believe we're not talking about athletes, entertainers, uh, politicians. We're talking about merchants. Merchants are concerned that Russia's coming for plunder and booty to take away Israel's livelihood. I believe they're concerned because they've got commercial interests at stake that Russia's coming after. So let's look closely at who is Tarshish biblically and historically. We know that Tarshish in Genesis chapter 10, it says, the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dadanin, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families and their nations. Four times it shows up, four additional times, uh, that they're dealing with the isles of the Gentiles, uh, Tarshish, Psalm 72, Isaiah 23, 60, and 66, as you see here. These verses are superimposed over a map of the British Isles. The British Isles are roughly around, they're oversized islands. They're about 6,000 islands. Over 200 of them are actually inhabited. So they do meet the description of the Isles of the Gentiles. Some archaeologists believe that Tarshish was beyond the Gibraltar. Now that would mean the Strait of Gibraltar. You see it as the furthermost part on this map of the Mediterranean Sea and beyond Gibraltar, you have the British Isles. I believe that would be a good argument for Tarshish. Tarshish was also well known in the Bible historically as merchants. They had riches. They're listed seven times. Here's one example in Ezekiel 27 verse 12. Tarshish was thy, dealing with Tyre in Lebanon, merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches now, the riches included silver, iron, tin, and lead. They traded in thy fairs. Remember that. Uh, this silver, iron, tin, and lead. Now, also, Tarshish was known for its seaworthy ships. Nine times it shows up speaking about the ships of Tarshish. These were seaworthy ships that could travel a long distance and carry lots of merchandise. The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market. And thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Ezekiel 27, verse 25, one of those nine verses. So they had, they were merchants. They carried on seaworthy ships, long distances, merchandise, including silver, iron, tin, and lead. I write about this scenario in the Now Prophecies book. It says, one of the things I write is about 587 BC, Ezekiel acknowledged that tin was among the primary metals that came from Tarshish. Cornwall, a county on England's rugged southwestern tip, was the only major source of tin in Europe for the past 2,500 years. It is also true that the mountains of Wales, just north of Cornwall, have been a source of all the minerals and metals listed above in Ezekiel 27, verse 12. That was a prior slide I gave you that quote. There was a study done in September of 2019. The Enigma of Bronze Age Tin was the title of it out of the Heidelberg University. Here's a summary of that study. It examined Bronze Age Tin from the second millennium BCE from Israel, Turkey, and Greece. The findings was the tin artifacts from Israel, for example, largely matched tin from Cornwall and Devon, and that would be in Great Britain. So we have another reason to believe archaeologically and uh, geographically, historically, that that, those, that merchandise, the merchants was coming from Tarshish to the UK. 
Now, in World War I, here's a poster. The UK was involved in the World War I, and they were enlisting the young lions uh, to come and join the old lions and enlist in the war. Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand. Now, America was a young lion of Tarshish, the UK, but of course, they had gained their, we had gained our independence prior to this, so we're not listed as on this particular poster, but that does not rule out the fact that we were a young lion of Tarshish. Now, at the time after the victory of World War I, when the UK uh, was involved in the victory of the Ottoman Empire, it was at its zenith as a world empire. It was known as the sun would, the empire in which the sun never set. You see a map here of all the sovereign places that the UK had control over. By 1922, over 458 million people were under this, the influence of, Israel, of uh, the UK. That was one fifth of the world's population. 13 million square miles, almost one quarter of the earth. So the, this shows you that Tarshish is an entity even into the 20th century. Now let's look at the geopolitical scenario. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, making the ability for the Arab states to regain their statehood and Israel, the Jewish state, to become a nation again. This could not have happened until World War I happened. So we find that when that happened, the UK and France were instrumental in reorganizing the Middle East. Uh, the UK, I've got banners up here saying Tarshish, had control over what is now Israel, what is now Jordan, that was called Transjordan at the time. Uh, prior to that, it was called Palestine. It was renamed Palestine in 135 AD, but it became Israel in 1948. But the UK had control also of, of Iraq, so Tarshish. Uh, France had control over Lebanon and Syria. Now, over time, you see on this image here that uh, the Arabs started to regain their statehood, Egypt in 1922 as the UK started to relinquish its interests and to start to begin to decline as an empire. So uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, 1932, Iran, 1935, Iran is Persian, uh, used to be called Persian until 1935. They're not necessarily Arab. Lebanon, 1943, Syria and Jordan, 1946. So France relinquished Syria and Lebanon, 1943 and 1946. And of course, Israel finally became a nation in 1948. The point being, there is no Spain in modern history dealing with events in the Middle East. There was France and there was the UK. So geopolitically, I do believe at this point we can rule Spain out as well. So the UK started to experience the abandonment wrath that we're concerned about America is going through. It turned its back on God. There are reasons I point out in the Now Prophecies, which I have devoted three chapters to America in Bible prophecy in the Now Prophecies. And the sun used to never set on the British Empire, but presently the sun does set all the time on the British Empire. It has been reduced down to about 90, sovereign over about 94,000 square miles versus the 13 million square miles it once was, was sovereign over, and about 66 million population versus the 458 million we talked about in the prior slide. Um, so we see right now that the UK, if it is Tarshish, the merchants of Tarshish, they would merely be protesters. They could no way come against the massive invasion Russia is gonna to put together with this coalition with Turkey and Iran. So we would say that they, could, they would simply be protesters having commercial interests of concern that Russia is coming after. Let's also look geopolitically at the Young Lions. The Young Lions of Tarshish, who's been involved in brokering Middle East peace deals in modernity? Well, America has in 1979, you see an image there of Jimmy Carter and Sadat of Egypt and Begin of Israel at the Camp David Treaty. That's a fragile peace treaty that Israel still maintains between Egypt and Israel. Bill Clinton was involved in the treaty with Jordan. You see that in 1994, also another fragile peace treaty. In my Now Prophecies book and Psalm 83 book, I point out that these peace treaties will vanish and they, uh, they are not, they're paper thin. Also in 2020, Donald Trump with the Abraham Accord, he's been instrumental in brokering peace in the Middle East with the UAE, Bahrain, of course, down in Africa with the Sudan and Morocco. And we don't see Spain here. We see America as a young lion being involved in Israel's 
peace scenario. And this peace will not happen through politically brokered deals, I believe, will happen militarily. That's when they will dwell Yeshav Batag. Also, <clears throat> J.R. Church wrote in his book, The Guardians of the Grail, on page 220, prophecy expert J.R. Church, he wrote, an inscription discovered in 1780 on a cliff above Mount Hope Bay in Bristol, Rhode Island, contained an engraving that read, Voyagers from Tarshish, this stone proclaims. It was believed to be inscribed around 533 BC. Now, Harvard University has found five locations within the United States where the merchants of Tarshish had colonies. So another argument, uh, putting Tarshish as the UK and America as their young lions. So if America is going to decline, how could it happen? And how soon could it happen? For the UK, it was around 70 years. I don't think it'll take that long for America. I'm concerned it'll be much swifter. I believe we're deep onto the end times line. I believe the Ezekiel 38 invasion is coming quickly, uh, followed by the Psalm 80, uh, it will follow the Psalm 83 war. I believe the Psalm 83 war will happen. And I point that out in my books. Could there be an international or domestic terrorism? We saw what happened on 911. Uh, we see what's going on across the country, the polarization that's going on. What about an economic collapse? When the pandemic hit, here's a headline back in March, the Dow had its worst point drop ever as stocks tumble. Economic decline. Now the stock market is over 31,000 as we talk, but is there a bubble? Is there a potential economic collapse coming? What about an electromagnetic pulse nuclear attack, an EMP? Uh, you have a map up here that an EMP is a nuclear weapon and depending on how the height that, that is burst altitude, uh, you can see that if, if, it, if this nuclear weapon went off 30 miles over the heartland of America, it would destroy this that inner, that circle there, the middle part of America. You see broader reaching, a 300 mile burst altitude up in the sky. You would see the nuclear weapon spread out at the speed of light, like a canopy, dropping the nuclear energy, the nuclear contamination down below and frying everything electronic, taking out much of Canada, all of America and part of Mexico. Now, China has a nuclear weapon. Russia has a nuclear weapon. North Korea has a nuclear weapon. Iran is working on getting nuclear weapons. Uh, what if something happens? Now, by the way, the things I'm telling you could happen, not just necessarily one of them, but all, all of them, or some of them in layered capacities. There could be a, an international terrorism and economic collapse. And when they see America is in trouble, uh, China could launch an EMP. I mean, who knows what the case may be. What about the rapture? Whoa, what if God all of a sudden, Jesus Christ came, who's yearning to get his bride, and took out millions of American Christians. How would that uh, upset the apple cart of American society? So let's talk about that for a moment. The rapture of the believers in the Christian church. Are you ready? Jesus Christ is yearning to come get his bride. At the twinkling of an eye, with the shout of an angel, and the sound of a trumpet, he's going to come and whisk his bride and catch her up into the clouds. The dead shall rise first, and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, to be with the Lord together forever. He's yearning to come and catch up his bride to be with him forever. You can read about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52. And in John 14, verses 1 through 6. In those verses in John, we we're told, let not your heart be troubled. How many of your hearts are troubled presently? Entering into 2021 with an uncertain future. You don't know what this year is going to hold. Reeling from nine months of a pandemic. Jesus tells you, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. He tells, he's talking to you personally nine times. Your, you, 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 nine times. Let your heart not be troubled. He's, you see an image here of a mansion. Imagine what the creator of the universe is preparing for you. Do not be troubled. He's preparing this for you. If you listen closely, you can hear the finishing nails being pounded into the cabinets. Is your, do you have a welcome mat with your name on it? A, a mailbox outside front of that mansion. To receive this ability to be getting a mansion in your father's house, in Jesus' father's house, you've got to be a believer. You've got to confess with your lips 
that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that he has risen from the dead and you shall be saved, you shall not be put to shame. Don't deprive yourself of this great gift of God. Receive your salvation today in Jesus Christ. He's coming to get his bride soon. You see what's going on in the world. You see that America is rapidly on the decline mode. Jesus Christ, he tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one gets to the Father but through me, to these mansions. Imagine the mansion he could prepare for you, the creator of the universe. Folks, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, as he said, is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. I'm here to tell you there is a pre-tribulation rapture before the tribulation period because we are told we shall be saved from that wrath through him in Romans 5. We are told that he is the one who's going to deliver us from that wrath that is to come in 1 Thessalonians 1. He did not, God did not appoint us to this wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, and 10. I will, and he says he will also keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the earth. It happens in the tribulation period, and therefore we are to comfort one another with these words. As we enter 2021 and we see these turbulent times, are you desperate for the rapture? Are you yearning for the rapture? Jesus is yearning to come get his bride. Are you tired of the secular narrative, the secular worldview with all of its fake news? Get your heart into the word, get your mind in the word of God. Read it, read the commentaries. Understand the biblical narrative and the prophetic perspective. Have a hunger for that. And let your heart, heart not be troubled. Jesus Christ is coming to get us soon. God bless you, and may the Lord keep you.